Welcome to City Cinema Tech, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today, we're continuing our exploration of post-war Italian cinema. We're seeing a late masterpiece by Lucino Visconti, Conversation Piece. Uh, it's an intimate film, and it, and it has an aged and aging um, Burt Lancaster as its protagonist, a marvelous performance. Uh, it's also an extraordinarily rich film, uh, visually, politically, and aesthetically. We'll be talking about that and much more after today's screening with a returning friend of City Cinema Tech, Professor Joe McElhaney of Hunter College, a noted expert on Lucino Visconti. Now, enjoy this voluptuous film, conversation piece. Welcome back to City Cinema Tech. I hope you've enjoyed this opportunity to see one of the great late films by Lucino Vis uh, Visconti. Uh, it's a film that is very Viscontian in many ways, but of course is always uh, variation and, and difference. There's much to talk about, and it's great to have with us today one of my colleagues from City University of New York, professor at Hunter College and the Graduate Center, Professor Joe McElhaney. Uh, Joe is an expert on a number of aspects of film history, but most recently has published a very important book on Lucino Visconti, Lucino Visconti and the Fabric of Cinema. Welcome back to City Cinema Tech, Joe. Thank you, Jerry. Great. So this is a film that is on a different scale in a certain set of ways than the, the, the things we associate with Visconti, with La Terra Trema, Death in Venice, The Leopard. These are really big, mm -hmm. big films. And this is a chamber film mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in, a number of, in a number of ways. So talk to us about why this film at this moment? What are all the factors that came to bear on him making a film like this at this moment? Well, what had happened to Visconti was that in the summer of 1972, he was editing Ludwig, mm -hmm. uh, a biopic about the so-called Mad King of Bavaria right. with Helmut Berger playing Ludwig. Um, and that was scaled uh, uh, on a very grandiose level, perhaps the biggest film, and sort of the longest film, Visconti had ever made, but while he was editing it, uh, he suffered a stroke. Oh, okay. And uh, so the pro any project he would engage in, any film project he would engage in after that would have to be reduced in its circumstances. So a couple of projects that he had been wanting to make for a number of years, uh, an adaptation of uh, The Magic Mountain and uh, a long chairs project of filming In Search of Lost Time had to be curtailed. Right. Um, so uh, the challenge that he had was how do I make another film but under these incredibly restricted circumstances okay. that I'm in due to my health, due to my body uh, in particular. Now he, he gave a challenge to Enrico Medioli who was his uh, screenwriter, had been a screenwriter for a number of years since co-screenwriter since okay. Rocco and his brothers. Now Visconti even before the stroke had been wanting to make an intimate film, uh, ideally he said with two characters in a single setting and he had been thinking about various possibilities here, um, and it was a challenge he would often throw out to Medioli. Okay. With the stroke, this was more urgent than ever, so he revived this idea once again with Medioli. So Medioli came up with an idea based uh, on two different apartments. Uh, one was his own, mm -hmm. which was constructed, he said, on two levels. Uh, one level was, it was an older building, mm -hmm. but one level was done in a more traditional style, the other level was a much more modern style. And you see that idea uh, yeah. articulated in the film. Absolutely. Once, especially once the, Brabant, once the Brabant family moves in and starts blasting, they construct right. it's about a garish modern apartment. Um, and then the other apartment was an apartment that belonged to Mario Prats, the Italian art collector and, and critic. And uh, it was filled with the art oh. that uh, Prats loved and collected. Uh, and he was particularly uh, fond of, um, well, Prats collected a lot of things, had a vast knowledge of art, but um, he had recently published a book uh, two years before Conversation Piece was made called Conversation Pieces, which was about the genre of Italian, excuse me, English painting right. in the 17th century, 18th century of uh, 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 English family life. Um, sometimes painted outdoors, sometimes painted indoors, but they were called conversation pieces. Okay. okay. That was the name of the genre. So out of this basic idea 
uh, came the idea for the film itself, the question of the setting, of the right. restricted setting, this idea of an art collector, someone who surrounds himself with beautiful objects out of the past. That was a, a basic generating idea for the film. Then out of this uh, comes the need to offer comfortable circumstances for Visconti. So there uh, is a cast. So it's a cast mainly comprised of actors he has already worked with okay. and with whom he's very familiar. Uh, Silvana Mangano, Helmut Berger comes back, uh, Claudio Cardinale in a cameo appearance. Uh, and the most important actor for the film, in the film, is Burt Lancaster Absolutely. as the professor. And Lancaster is especially important. Now, this is the first time uh, he's worked with Visconti since The Leopard. But um, this was a non-commercial project conversation piece. It, it would not attract, it did not attract big, big investors. Um, and so Lancaster agreed to do the project. Mm -hmm. The problem was no insurance company would uh, insure Visconti because of his health. And Lancaster uh, agreed to act as a guarantor. He said, if anything happened to him and he cannot finish production on this film, I will finish it. I will direct it. And so because of that, the film was allowed to happen. You know, you bring up this very interesting point about Lancaster fr from several angles, which is that people know of him as, as you know, one of the great actors of his, of his, of his generation, but it's not as well known the degree to which, you know, he was an active producer as mm -hmm. well as deeply engaged in these other aspects. And he had directed as well. Yeah, yeah, yes. Right. Ab ab absolutely, absolutely, right. absolutely. And he took risks. He took real challenges. Um, people often, so often associate him with action films. But in fact, some of his most notable films, performances, are in these very restricted settings, like The Bird Band of Alcatraz. Absolutely. Or often playing against type, like in Sweet Smell of Success, for example. Uh, so this is not that much of a stretch for him. It just fits in with a certain pattern of playing these very repressed characters. Uh, and he gives, I think, a very striking, uh, very memorable performance in it, which we can talk about, because what he does specifically in the film raises all kinds of interesting issues in terms of this character of the professor. Well, let me, let me just loop us back once again to somebody you've already, me already mentioned, which is uh, Mario Praz, mm -hmm. the, 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 the scholar, because uh, he was also one of the people who helped theorize interior design, mm -hmm. yes. you know, as part of the, as part of what we would now call the history of visual culture and, and, and of modern culture. And this is, if, if I were to, to have to name, you know, a half a dozen films that are obsessed with interior design and the relationship between the characters and drama, this would be one of, this mm -hmm. would be one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so th there's this way in which uh, in internal states uh, and the progress of internal states of characters are written across this film right. by all, all of these interior design issues that we can be formulated. Absolutely, and you see in this film who the professor is precisely through the decor uh, of, this, uh, of this lavish apartment set. Now, it was an expensive film to make, even though the settings were restricted, but Visconti, of course, always does everything on a, did everything on a very lavish scale, so this was still an expensive film to mount because of those enormous sets that are the professor's home. We never go outdoors in the film. Even when we go out onto the terrace, it's clearly a studio set. Right. So uh, Visconti did not go anywhere. He refused still to sit in a standard director's chair. He liked to be quite physical when he directed, to mm -hmm. stand up and move about and to interact with the actors and the crew in a very engaged manner. That was somewhat restricted here, but he always insisted on l at least standing up right. while he directed so that the actors, the crew could feel physically he was there and in control. Right. Well, l let's talk a little about his, his choice of the aspect ratio right. of the film. Touch. Right. So he shoots in Tadio 35, which is a widescreen anamorphic process. Not the kind of thing that you would ordinarily <laughs> think of doing for a very intimate drama like this. Right. But this very wide frame allows him to, I think, create a sense, well, it does several things. One is the magnitude, the sheer scale of this apartment, right. of this yeah. setting. Uh, he is still another one of Visconti's uh, uh, de facto aristocrats. He's not a true aristocrat, but he, he, there's, a, there's a way in which he is. But he fits within an aristocratic culture, if he not lives being. In the grand style. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, so it, it, it imparts that uh, to the professor's life. But it also, there's so often more than one thing going on in, in an individual frame at one time. Uh, and one of the things that's especially striking about the film is you see the art he collects, mm -hmm. uh, in particular the conversation pieces, but you also see the sculptures that he collects. Correct. Now the conversation pieces are quite chaste, uh, quite respectful, families elegantly dressed, posed, this idea of the family as perhaps even a space of repression. 
Right. And one of the things this film is about is repression. Yeah. Uh, however, the sculptures he collects, no one ever comments on them. I mean, yeah. the, the characters in the fiction right. talking about comment on them, but they're always erotic. Right. Uh, and so there's this contrast set up between uh, these uh, conversation pieces on the one hand, very chaste, and then these incredibly erotic sculptures. So you'll see in the foreground an erotic sculpture, and then the professor here, and then perhaps a painting in the background. Uh, it's, it's a great point, and it's one of those things where a spectator may not even think they're noticing it, but because of the uh, aspect ratio and, and and the framing, there it is. I mean, right, it's, right. it's just part of the texture of the life of the, uh, of the apartment, whether, as you point out so correctly, whether the characters d ever discuss it mm -hmm. or not, we're getting this entire flow of information out of the uh, out, out of the mise en, mise en scene. Yes. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, shifting, staying on context, but shifting from him mm -hmm. over to the fact that we're in these interior spaces, but it's, it's very much a film set at a particular moment mm -hmm. in Italy's history, and you know, to, to say the, you know, something perhaps obvious, you know, history and the outside forces are leaking inside right. in all kinds of ways. So set us up about what may have been obvious to a European audience when they're seeing it in the 1970s. Certainly to an Italian audience. Uh, certainly to an Italian audience. Right. Uh, versus what, what we may need to know about the context mm -hmm. of, of this. So we have the context of Visconti's health, which is crucial for understanding the film, the form of the film, its style, but also the political situation in Italy is also important for understanding, I would say, the content of the drama itself. Right. Uh, and what initiates much of the dramatic action of the film. And that is tied to the political situation in Italy in the early 1970s, a time when you have uh, a good deal of conflict between the Italian left and the Italian right, and a good deal of violence, uh, terrorist acts, uh, and so on. This was happening before the film was made, it was happening during the film's production, while Visconti was editing the film, uh, a train in Barcelona was blown up, uh, and something like 12 people died. So this is the general, and also for the Italian, the general Italian public, not committed strongly right. to the left or the right, they couldn't tell the difference really between <laughs> what a, a bomb is going off. What difference does it make? By right, no, the left or the right. There's just this sense of political violence and chaos out there somewhere, um, and so and the, and the character of Conrad uh, is crucial here. Um, he's not setting off the bombs himself, but he is a, a figure who has survived. Uh, the political issues of 1968, as he articulates right, directly absolutely. in the dialogue. Uh, and he's still connected uh, to these figures, and of course that crucial sequence when some of them break into the building and, right. uh, and beat him up. Um, so Conrad then embodies this question of politics and political change uh, of a very different nature from what formed the professor. Mm -hmm. So certainly one of the things is this film is about, it's about many things, but one of them is about this relationship between politi the politics of the past, political commitment, political mm -hmm. energies of the past connected with the professor, and in particular the Second World War and anti-fascism and what is happening in Italy in the aftermath of 68, the sense of confusion, uh, what's the next step, what should we do now? And I think the professor, you have Conrad's uncertainty, and then there's the professor's um, sense that what is happening now is, for him, uh, just, horrific. Yes. Uh, the present day is for the professor a source of continuous anxiety, something he wants to retreat from. He thinks that it's for him, at least initially, it's, it is total barbarism. Now the encounter with Conrad complicates uh, right. his, his uh, sureness in relation to this, but that's certainly his initial uh, position on the present day. So the space of the apartment is, among other things, this pulling away from, retreating from what's happening out there in present day Italy that he wants nothing to do with. And, and then they show up, and it it comes in in any number of ways. I mean, right. literally, literally. I mean, you you uh, Visconti communicates it in any number of cinematic ways right. through the sound. Um, sound is crucial to this film. Yeah, we need to talk about it. I think. But yes, this whole question of this. First of all, it's a film about family. Right. Uh, so many of Visconti's fun films are anyway. I think virtually all of them are in some way or other about family. Uh, this one is especially interesting because it's a kind of displaced family. Uh, that occurs here. Um, and who are these people anyway? Uh, Romantes and uh, Conrad, they seem to be real people. Right. Um, at the same time, they seem to be something he himself has conjured up or that have been conjured up somewhere and brought into this space. Uh, are they the present day, but they seem to 
unleash something in the professor's mind that brings up these figures, these ghosts out of the past, specifically his former wife and his mother. Uh, even the whole introduction of, yeah. uh, the, of uh, the Marchesa, she's just sitting there in the opening sequence on the couch. Where did she come from? I mean, she, the, well, the maid let yeah. me in, but why, there was no list, apartment listing. She was looking for her, what is she doing here? She just seems to have been summoned up by something. No, absolutely. And the, the way in which she says, wait a minute, you weren't with them? Right. I mean, she's just appeared, and so he can't imagine how, how she has come, how she has come to, to, be, to be there. And, and, you know, and of course, in, in these, I mean, it's a very verbal film, right. but, one should not, but one should not underestimate the physicality of the performances, right. whether it be in a lot of the restraint of, of, uh, of Lancaster or it, wh whether it be the, the, you know, the full gestural right. style of uh, Silvana Mangano, uh, right. uh, Mangano character. Yes, I mean, first of all, we could say on one level this family represents the present day. Yeah. However, perhaps Lieta and, and Stefano uh, do, Conrad already seems to be somebody out of the past. He's connected yeah. to 68, has not fully recovered from that moment, and is tr not trying to move on, but certainly the decadence of Conrad by this point, essentially a kept boy for the Marchesa, right. is indicative of somehow the ideals of 68 have degenerated, have right. become purely decadent. Right. Um, and then there's the Marchesa. She looks like something out of the 1930s with the pencil thinned yeah eyebrows and the wardrobe, everything looks like, she looks like something who has stepped out of the past. Right. Uh, so the extent to which they are present day, to what, to what extent they are, in fact, figures who bring the past up into the present day. Uh, and of the sort of emotional upheaval that this creates is uh, also key to the film. Well, you know, let's, let's, let's stick with that for just a moment because um, on the one hand, the overall trajectory of this film is quite is quite linear. That is, you know, we have the arrival of the stranger, and then we have the disruption of the household, etc. But but and while that while that while that's true, there are these other aspects of of layering in the film and of uh, flashback and and the a, a, a chronological. So talk a little bit, uh, uh, you know, about Mama and the wife, because right. they, they both arrive in the film in very interesting ways right. and in relationship to the Marquesa, I think. Right, right, because the wife, the memories don't really happen until halfway into the film's running time. Yeah. And what's crucial is that it's actually sound that initiates, the sound of the doorbell, which is blurred with the sound of a telephone ringing and the sound of the parrot and the sound of his present day maid, uh, which then blends in with this maid out of the past. Um, and so, it, it, again, you mentioned earlier that sound is so crucial to this film, and this is one of the pivotal moments. Sound seems to initiate memory, or sound, there's always a sound somewhere, and this film is much about sound as it is about image. Uh, and so many things in this film are, we hear them before we see them, or, or we hear them but don't see them. Conrad's whole introduction to the film is a happens twice through sound. Right. First we hear his voice off camera, they recognize it, the Marchesa and Lieta right. and uh, Stefano. Uh, then Conrad comes in and we hear his voice again and that's when the professor hears something in, that, in the content and then the voice and looks and you get to zoom in uh, to, to Conrad. Uh, but this flashback to the, uh, the mother uh, played out initially through sound and through voice and through image. Um, now we have the mother on the one hand and the wife on the other. We know that the, the marriage did not work out. Right. Uh, in one of the flashbacks, she is weeping, uh, Cardinale's wife is, uh, presumably over some kind of infidelity. And the infidelity occurs presumably because there is something sexually unfulfilling about right. this marriage. She had no choice. Right. Uh, he loves her, but he cannot fulfill her. Right. Not, she has, has no overpowering sexual needs. He clearly just is right. not able to fulfill any right. kind of sexual yeah, right. uh, desire she might have for him. Um, and there seems to be an implied linkage between this idealization of the mother, because mm -hmm. the first time we see the mother come in and it's all a uh, point of view shot of the professor as a boy mm -hmm. and she comes in and she's beautifully dressed and veiled and uh, fabric flowing everywhere and she comes over and she's, so, she's beautiful and she's taunting at the same time, like, almost like a kind of sexual right. humiliation almost right. of this little boy. She is at any rate this overpowering maternal figure right. of a kind we often find uh, in Visconti. And so there's almost a, an implied sense in which his sexual, um, I'm going to call them problems, let's say sexual inhibitions are perhaps tied to his, this initial relationship with the mother that he mm -hmm. could not recover from. 
Uh, and so then in comes the Marchesa, who represents something else. Uh, she's not like his mother. She's not like his ex-wife. She is this overpowering figure of some kind of transgressive maternal desire. She is uh -huh. a mother, uh, but the family that she represents <laughs> is an unusual family. Uh, she has a husband, um, and she has her daughter, and she has Stefano, and then she has Conrad, but we see later that Conrad is also sleeping with her daughter. Right. Uh, and perhaps there's some kind of three -way si sexual right. three-way situation with Stefano and right. Lieta, uh and the daughter. Um, and when the professor first sees Stefano, he presumes that's her son. And she goes, right. oh, no, that's, that's not my son. Uh, and she makes some reference to the fact that we don't know who the father actually could be. <laughs> and Stefano has this look on his face, like, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Yeah, but yeah. It, the, but the, the point is, one of the things the film is fascinated by is this, this, it wants to redefine what a family could possibly exactly. be. Uh, and so the last thing the professor wants initially is a family in his space, anybody coming in to the space. Uh, but they come into the space and disrupt his life and make his life very difficult, bring up these ghosts of the past. Um, and then by the time the film is over with, he has that wonderful, strange monologue where he toasts them effectively. Uh, this awful family uh, that have brought a kind of joy into his life. Um, they have brought life into his life. Right. Uh, he suddenly realizes, with all this disruption, all this agony he has undergone, uh, that he actually had been dead for many, many years, right. and that he has temporarily, briefly been brought back to life. And the death of Conrad will put him back into that state of perpetual sleep. Well, this relationship of, 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 of family, obviously, and, and because this is a very unusual family, brings up the whole question of eroticism and sexuality, right. um, you know, in, in, in the film. But this is not a, you know, a film that is comfortable with, with it, it may implant an initial binary of some kind, mm -hmm. and then the film always wants to take that apart yeah. and show it's much more complicated than what yeah. you thought it was. If you thought that was the setup we're going to stay with, that's not where we're going to rest, right. you know, at, at, at all, including things like the, uh, the, the, the question of the, of the death uh, of Conrad and who, whose interpretation is it? Is it suicide or is it murder? Right. Exactly. Um, right. And, and who's responsible? Right, Is uh, Stefano responsible for it? His scarf seems to be on the kitchen floor, but we don't know. And of course, Lietta says it's murder, but she doesn't say Stefano did it. Uh, they did it, she says. Uh, but the Marchese is convinced it's suicide. Uh, so there's all that uncertainty. But the uncertainty also gets manifested in, in sexuality. Right, itself, exactly. Specifically the professors. Right. We don't quite understand. It's never made explicit. Uh, is he a repressed homosexual? That would seem right. to be perhaps implicit in his relationship with his wife. It might be tied to the overall idealization of the mother. Um, but the relationship with Conrad, is he sexually attracted to Conrad or is he seeing something else or is he, seeing, is he sexually attracted and he's attracted to other aspects of Conrad? That sh scene where he showers is interesting because he's naked, uh, the professor is in the room with him and this is a shot, reverse shot between right, the two exactly. of them. And he hands him the towel, this is the issue with the towel and so on. But the way Lancaster plays that scene, he doesn't particularly look at Helmut Berger with any particular lust or indi Re anything indicating repression. And I think, for example, if you compare or really contrast that performance with what Dirk Bogard does in Death in Venice, where he's always looking at the boy Taju with uh, it, it telegraphing Dirk Bogard as this repressed sexual desire and so on. Lancaster doesn't do any of that. Uh, it's, again, almost chaste. Is that further indicative of a, a, is a repression so deep down that it's still not seen or he's not even unconsciously making it visible? Because this film is so much about camouflage oh, okay. yes. and uh, closeted yeah. desires. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's, the house is also, the apartment is certainly is also a space of repression. And um, the crucial space really is that space that um, the mother had used during the right. Second World War to hide uh, political dissidents and Jews and so on. So it, it's specific, it's not, it wasn't his space, uh, it was the mother's space. And so the apartment space is also a maternal space. And in particular, that space of hiding uh, is linked uh, with the mother. 
And that's also where the professor, in a sense, hides Conrad after he's been beaten up. So he's hidden in this space of political, for political refugees uh, from the Second World War. Um, but it's also, again, a maternal space, the space of the womb, you might say, the space of the body of the mother. Absolutely. We're going to have to, Joe, we're going to have to end on that. Yeah. Uh, and, but it's a, good, it's a good place to end because there's still a lot to think about. Right. As soon as you've implanted that idea, you can read a whole number of things right. uh, um, in the film. There's a lot more to talk about, but we don't have the time. To <laughs> these things happen. <laughs> these, things, these things happen. Um, if you'd like to know more about City Cinema Tech or more generally about the programming here at CUNY TV, there is a way to find out. It's not going to be a big surprise. It is visiting our website. Please visit www.cuny.tv. There you'll find the schedule for City Cinema Tech. Uh, you'll also find links to our YouTube channel so you can see some past episodes, both of this series and of other series on CUNY TV. Indeed, the website has the full um, schedule of everything we do here. Uh, so please visit www.cuny.tv. Joe, always a pleasure having you here. Time flies uh, when we're talking about uh, Lucina Visconti uh, together. Thank you so much for your expertise and insight. Thank you for having me. Great. And I want to thank you for joining us here today on City Cinema Tech. And I hope you join us in weeks to come as we continue to explore the archives of film history. Goodbye for now. <laughs>